try that again. Good evening to you. If you got your New Testaments with you, be opening up to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, Primero de Juan, capítulo 2, verso 15. That's where we're going to start this evening, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. We have visitors in our audience. We're thankful that you're here. If you're able to stick, Mackenzie, is that you? Good to see you. If you're able to stick around a little while after services so that we can meet you and get to know you a little bit better, we sure would appreciate you doing that. And we'll meet again this Wednesday evening at 7.30. We'd love to have you with us then. Uh, there's a gentleman right now sitting right in front of Lynn Angel. I'm looking right at him. He's got white hair. His name is Eric Vaughn. He will probably be wearing his red hat after services. There it is. If you haven't had a chance to meet Eric yet, Eric is from Oklahoma. He and I have been talking on the phone for, I guess, several months now, haven't we, Eric? But if you have an opportunity to meet Eric after services, do that. He would love to meet you, and you would enjoy getting to meet him. But we're thankful we can be together this evening. I you did a good job reading 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 for us. And it's one concept that John addresses over and over and over again in this first epistle, and it is the world. And as we read these three verses here in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, the message of the Holy Spirit through John is exceptionally clear. That as Christians, you and I cannot and must not love the world. When we hear sermons and teachings about worldliness, this is what we're talking about. We can't love the world, we can't let the world seep into our lives, we can't let the world detract us and tear our vision away from the one upon whom we have set our sights. We have to focus on Jesus. We have to take up the cross and follow him. And yet we recognize we've got a world around us that is calling us to do anything and everything except for that. But what is worldliness? And when John, through the Holy Spirit, writes to us here in 1 John chapter 2 and says, do not love the world, what does he mean? Are we talking about this globe here? If not, what are we talking about? What we want to examine this evening. What does John mean when he tells us, do not love the world? We want to find an answer for that in our Bibles this evening. And then we want you to just see some practical ways that we can make sure that we're focused on the Father, make sure that we're focused on Jesus, and make sure that we've not allowed the love of this world to creep uh, very, very craftily into our lives. Here's our reading. Go over it with me again, 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, where John writes, Do not love the world. John is fond of writing about this concept of love. He does it often. Perhaps the best known verse from John is from his gospel account, chapter 3 and verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's a theme he picks up again in 1 John chapter 3, but here in chapter 2, he's writing about love, this time not the love from the Father, but he's giving us a cautionary tale about our love. Not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the love of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. First thing I want you to see with me is this, that uh, John, as he is writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is going to use this phrase, the world, in a variety of different ways. This is not uncommon. Many biblical authors do this, and we do this even in our own conversation, don't we? We will use the same words or the same phrases, but in different contexts, they mean different things. The writers of the New Testament are no different. Uh, for example, as you're looking at chapter 2 and verse 17, the world is passing away. Sometimes John uses this phrase, the world, to describe the earth and the things that exist as part of this terrestrial existence. And in these instances, the focus is on the temporal, the temporary nature of these things, right? We've got the world in front of us, but one day the world is gone. 
and the things of the world are gone. Look one chapter over to chapter 3 and verse 17. In chapter 3 and verse 17, whoever has this world's goods and beholds his brother in need but closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? The one who has the world's good is the one who has the things of this earth but things that will eventually go away, and that's kind of the point here, that if you've got something that, that is temporarily yours, shouldn't you use it, shouldn't we use it for the betterment of ourselves and others? But if we're just going to hoard on to it, we've, we've missed the point of love all throughout Scripture. Sometimes the world means the earth and the things that exist as part of it, and it's an emphasis to us on the temporary nature of these things. Sometimes the world is the aspect of God's creation that does not know him. Right? And in this instance, we're talking about people. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Primero de Juan capítulo 3, verso 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Describe the world from 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. It does not know God, and it does not know the people of God. It stands in contrast to the children of God. So you've got the children of God on one hand in 1 John 3 and verse 1, and on the other hand, you've got the world. Here's the distinction here. Right? Evidently a very different usage of the world from 1 John 2 and verse 17. So we're, we're tracking all of this, seeing that this phrase, the world, can be used in different ways. Look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. Primero de Juan capítulo 5, verso 10. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. The world is the realm over which Satan exerts his influence. It's his kingdom, if you will. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, of Satan. Here is the world being the realm over which Satan exerts some degree of influence. Stay in the same chapter, look at verse 4, verso 4. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. So here, the world is set in contrast to those who were born of God and possess faith and overcome by means of victory. Contrasted to that is the world, the realm over which Satan exerts influence, a realm which is ultimately defeated. And then look at chapter 4, capítulo 4, verso 9, chapter 4 and look at verse 9. Sometimes John uses the world simply as a reference to humanity and the human experience. In this sense, you and I are in the world. We live in the world. It is part of our human experience. This is where we live. This is where we move. This is where we have our interaction. Verse 9, better so nueve, by this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only son where? into the world. He has sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And again, verse 14, verso 14, and we have beheld and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, to be the Savior of mankind. So what does John mean then? When we come here to chapter 2, and that's our focus tonight, when we're looking at chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, what does John mean here by the world? Read it again with me. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. So, so we, we've got kind of a division here, don't we? Don't love the world? Then we're getting even more specific. Do not love the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. The world is passing away 
and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. If you're reading through those three verses, what contrast is immediately jumping out to you on the verses of the, the, the pages that we've just read there? The world and the Father. In whatever way John is using the world here, it is in contrast, J.J., it is in contradistinction to the Father. It certainly has reference to the earth and to, to all that exists as a part of it, right? The world is passing away and also its lusts. But it is a concept that competes with God and what his position should be in our lives. If anyone loves the world, then what? If anyone loves the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. That, that is just a statement from God that is laid plain for our consideration and for our acceptance. If we love the world, then John clearly tells us the love of the Father is not within us. If we want to love the Father, we're not going to love the world. What all is involved in that, though? How, what does it mean to love the world? To, to some... To some, when John says here, do not love the world, some almost take that to mean that, that we can't have any sort of attachment to anything here on this earth that is temporary. I think that goes a little bit too far, and let, let me demonstrate why I believe that. Forbidding us in 1 John chapter 2 to have any sort of attachment to the things of that mark this human realm let me give you three good examples of that we could look at psalm 19 we could look at romans chapter 1 but i want you to look at matthew chapter 6 with me i think matthew chapter 6 expresses this same idea to us mateo capitulo 6 and we're going to be over here in mateo capitulo ah Says verso 29, Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 27, 28, and 29. Versos 27 a 29. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 27, Jesus says this Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his life's span? And why are you anxious about clothing? Then what's his next? statement here consider the lilies of the field how they don't toil and they don't spin the idea there is spinning thread and yet solomon in all of his glory was not even arrayed like one of these but if god this is verse 30 if god so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the not much more do so for you, O you of little faith. What does Jesus tell us to do with the terrestrial creation? What does Jesus tell us to do with, with, the, with the vegetation that God has put on this earth? He says what? Consider it. Look at it. Observe it. Appreciate it. Why? Because it talks to us about him. And that's the message of the 19th Psalm. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech and night after night brings forth knowledge. That God has revealed himself where? In the natural world. And Jesus picking up on that reality tells us to do what? Look at it. Observe it. Think about it, contemplate it, pour over it, appreciate it, love it, because it reveals our Father to us. God does not forbid us from loving the evidence of His existence that He has dotted all across the creation. Nor does God forbid us to love mankind that He has placed on the earth. Look at James chapter 2 and verse 8. Santiago capítulo 2, verso 8. James chapter 2, and look over here at verse 8. 
If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. What are we to do very basically in this life? James makes it clear here. We are to love our neighbor. We're to love mankind that has been placed on this earth. Even though one day this earth is going away, we'll go off into one of two eternal destinies. But God still encourages us while we're here on this earth to love each other. And that love extends to taking care of each other. Even in these bodies that are, that are wasting away. But then perhaps more clear. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesios capitulo 5 verso 25. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. Where Paul simply gives this instruction to families. And he says what? To husbands. Husbands, love your wives. And, and the, the other side of this coin is found in, in Titus chapter 2 and verse 4, where the older women are to teach the younger women to do what? Love their husbands. Yet what does Jesus tell us in the gospel accounts very clearly about marriage? Marriage is not eternal, right? Marriage lasts as long as our lives together last, but when one spouse or the other dies, that marriage ends. Marriage is, for all intents and purposes, a relationship that is temporal. It is only while we are here upon the earth. And yet, over and over again in Scripture, God is going to call upon us to love our spouse. We take that then and then we arrive at this conclusion that what we're seeing in 1 John chapter 2 does not, and I know this is a double negative, and if you're, you're an English person, this is crawling up your skin. I couldn't think of a better way to express it. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 does not require us to have no attachments to anything in this life. 1 John chapter 2, do not love the world nor the things in the world. That does not mean have no attachments to this life. Have no attachments to the things that are temporal. That's not the point of 1 John 2. Because the same apostles are going to talk to us about loving our spouses and loving our fellow man and appreciating the, the creation that God has given us and learning from it. Some people come to 1 John chapter 2 and think, well, basically what we have to do is just live this nomadic type of existence where we have no attachments and no appreciation for anything in this life and it becomes a, j just a, a very devalued form of life. That's not what John is saying. Well, if, if that's not what he's saying, then what is he saying? And that, that's what we need to grasp. What is John saying then? He's telling us as we come back to 1 John chapter 2, Primero de Juan, Capitulo 2, we're coming back to 1 John 2. And what John is telling us is what we must not love. There are some things that as children of God, we simply cannot love. We cannot allow into our lives. We cannot allow to overtake our hearts. Look again at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. Capitulo 2, verso 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We must not love the world that competes with the Father. That's the point here in 1 John. That there are some things in this life that will compete for our attention and our affection towards the Father. And John says those things we must not love. Well, what are these things? Look at verse 16. All that is in the world, to the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, 
is not from the Father, but is from the world. John's going to specifically identify two, two concepts within the framework of the world that compete with the Father. There is lust and there is pride. He talks to us first here in chapter 2 and verse 16 about the lust of the flesh. Uh, the, the lust of the flesh. Lust is simply a word that means strong desire. Uh, this word can be positive or negative depending upon its connotation. Pardon me, depending upon its context. Uh, we often say lust is bad, and we're basing that off of Matthew chapter 5 that, that you're not supposed to look who is not your spouse with lust in your heart. And certainly that, that's true. Uh, but I would caution us against just making a blanket statement that lust is wrong because that same Greek word is going to be used by our Savior in speaking to his disciples just before the night in which he is betrayed when he says to his disciples, I have fervently desired, and there's our Greek word lust, I have lusted to eat this Passover with you. There is some lust that is acceptable. There is some lust that is unacceptable. There is some lust that is consistent with the will of God. There is some lust that is inconsistent with the will of God. And obviously here we're talking about desire that is inconsistent with the will of God. Uh, one type of desire he talks about here that is inconsistent with the will of God is the lust of the flesh. Uh, that is seeking to fulfill inward desires in improper ways. Perhaps the best example of this is the reality that God created humanity with a sex drive. And yet, as God looks at us with this, this part of His creation within us, He also gives us a framework for, for meeting that desire, that appetite. Hebrews 13 and verse 4, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed is undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers not. God has given us the appetite, but he's also given us a realm in which that appetite is to be fulfilled. But when we have these desires and we're seeking to fulfill these desires in just whatever way we want to and, and not giving any sort of thought to what God has to say about fulfilling them, that's the lust of the flesh. He then talks about the lust of the eyes in chapter 2 and verse 16. Th this would be desiring the improper things that we see. Lust of the flesh seems to be more inwardly driven. Lust of the eye seems to be more outwardly driven. We are captivated by what we see. That we see something and it captures our attention with the idea of this text being we, we focus on it way more than we should. It becomes a reason and a purpose for our living but a reason and a purpose for our living above and beyond Jesus, above and beyond the Father. It's kind of a mixture of the one that comes before it, the lust of the flesh, and the one that comes after it, the boastful pride of life. Bauer, Arndt, Danker, and Gingrich in their commentary note that this idea of the boastful pride of life is simply pride in one's possessions. It's self-glory. It's, this is what I have, look at me. And then thinking of myself in a certain way, often an exalted way, or thinking of others in a much more lowly way. Exalting myself and putting others down, whether I'm doing that verbally, whether I'm doing that vocally, whether I'm doing that just within my own mind. The boastful pride of life, which looks at externals and on the basis of externals thinks, I'm better than you. Or how it might play out more practically in our lives. Deciding that if somebody does not have the kind of car that we think they should have or the kind of clothing that we think they should have, or they're not able to maintain the kind of diet that we think they should have and we look down on them because of these sorts of things we self-glory 
and we put others to shame, and this is where James will come into us in James chapter 2 and say, what, my brethren, these things ought not to be so. John identifies the world in connection with these three concepts, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, and he says these things are not from the Father, but they're from the world. But yet we, we look at these, these appetites, and who gave us these appetites? Who gave us inward desire? God did. Who gave us eyes with which to see? God did. Who gave us the blessings in this world? God did. But in each one of those avenues, God also gave us a, a way in which we are to fulfill them. And when we seek to fulfill these desires and to gratify self outside of God's plan, that's where it becomes not of the Father, but of the world. But that's what the world tells us, right? If you want to do it, then do it and don't listen to anybody else. Do what makes you feel good. You only live once, YOLO, right? You only live once. You, you live however you want to live and don't let anyone. The worst thing you can do is not be true to yourself. That's what the world tells us. And in response to those kinds of mindsets, John says these things are not from the Father, but they're from the world. We, we should note, John is not trying to give us some sort of strict taxonomy for categorizing sin. He, he's not giving, okay, these are, these are the three categories, and we need to plot out which sins go in which column. Or we've got three buckets, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, and, and we're, we're, we're divvying up the sins like playing cards and throwing them into the bucket, right? I, I have seen Bible classes go down that route before. Might there be some personal benefit in, in thinking through some of those things? Sure. But if what we're doing with 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16 is just coming up with three columns and starting to list sins in these columns, we're missing the point here. There's a, there's a much bigger point going on here. John is describing to us in these three verses the hurdles to godliness. These are the things that stand in the way of godliness. The inward desires and fulfilling them improperly. The arrogance and self-glory that we're tempted to exhibit in this life. And then looking at things and desiring them and desiring them more than we desire God. Practically, we should not live for such things. Look at chapter 2 and verse 17. John, John gets very, very ground level here. You think about all of the people around us. Maybe, maybe this describes me in my life to some degree too. Maybe this describes you in your life to some degree. You know better than I do. But we see people, maybe even we see ourselves putting so much time and so much energy and so much money into things and stuff and the accolades of this world. Gracious, we even pour a lot of time and energy and effort into our bodies. Bodily exercise is good. Some of us might go overboard with that. Forgetting that one day what's going to happen to this body. It's going to return to dust and then God's going to reform it at the resurrection. We pour ourselves into all of these things. That one day are going to do what? They're going to dissolve, and they're gone. And what are we going to do then? The stories from when the Depression hit in New York are terrible. That as people saw their livelihoods 
failing away, people were hurling themselves out of windows, killing themselves. Scenes that we might remember from seeing footage on September 11th were happening back in the time of the Great Depression when it was initially happening. And there's the story, I'm sure it's probably anecdotal, but it's still a good story of, of a father who lived near Wall Street calling his, his children in from their rooms and sitting them down. This was a very well-to-do family and the father sitting down and showing them the money that he had in his billfold and saying, kids, this is all we have left. But we have each other. And we have God. And we'll navigate this. And we'll make it through. That's the attitude. But the attitude where we're living for all of the stuff in this world, where we're living for the pleasure, when we're living for the trappings of wealth, we're, we're living just to, just to get a little bit higher on the social ladder. If that's the kind of life that we're seeking after, one day this life and that ladder are gone. And what we will be left with is self standing in the judgment seat of Christ. And there's no suitcase with us, and there's no U-Haul. It is me, and here I am in front of Jesus. What am I living for? If you live for the things of this world, and the glory and the approval of this world, and then one day it's all gone. And where am I? There's a serious competition that goes on around us. A competition which we're involved every day. It's the competition between the world and God. And the prize is me. And the prize is you. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Marvin Vincent, in his, in his word study, notes about this phrase, the love of the Father is not in him. The phrase only occurs here in 1 John 2 in the New Testament. It means love towards the Father, but a love towards the Father that is generated by the Father's love to man. Look at 1 John chapter 3. This is what he references. He says, see how great the lo a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it does not know or it did not know Him. The love of the Father, we love the Father because the Father has first loved us. Here is this competition that is raging around us, and if we look at our lives as you and I peel away the layers and we look at our hearts and we look at who I truly am, one of these statements is true in my life. I love the Father and therefore I do not love the world. Or I love the world and therefore I do not love the Father. There's no room for I, I kind of love the Father and I kind of love the world. I mostly love the Father, but I a little bit love the world. What does Jesus say about that? No man can do what? No man can serve two masters. Either he loves the one and hates the other, or he clings to one and despises the other. You cannot serve God and riches. One of these statements is true about my life. I love the Father and I do not love the world, or I love the world and I do not love the Father. And there's a test. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 17. The world is passing away and also its lust. But here's our test. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. There's the test. You remember when you wanted a practice test in middle school and high school? 
and you got a practice test, and then you got the test the next day, and you sat down and you realized the test was the same thing as a practice test. And if you looked over it, you were sitting great. Now, I never looked over it, and so I was lost as everybody else. But if you looked over that practice test and it was the same one as the test, man, how great that was. Here's the test. He who does the will of God abides forever. How do I know that I love the Father and do not love the world? Because I do the will of the Father. How do I know that I love the world and do not love the Father? Because I don't do the Father's will. John makes it real clear for us here. Let's end by... by just four simple applications, not, not long applications, simple ones, four simple ones. Look at 1 John 3 and verse 14. Capitulo tres, verso catorce. Number one is this. Let's look at doing the will of our Father. Number one, and we're going to pick this up next Sunday morning, but I wanted to get to this point right here. How do I know if I love the Father? Here's four tests that John gives us to know whether or not we love the Father. If we're doing the Father's will. Number one, do I love my brethren? Chapter 3 and verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death and into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Brother Bestman spoke to us this morning, did a good job emphasizing our need for example on Sundays and Wednesdays when we come together as a church to put an effort to all be here. To prioritize one another. And to prioritize the worship of our Heavenly Father. This is part of the reason. What does it say about my attitude towards my brethren if when my brethren are assembled, I choose? That's all I'm talking about, like Travis was talking about this morning. I'm talking about a choice. There are sometimes we don't have the choice, right? Sometimes we just can't be here. Not talking about that. I'm talking about a choice. When my brethren are here, and I choose to be somewhere else. Does that say I love my brethren? I really don't think it does, do you? We need to think about that. If I love my brethren, when my brethren call me and need me, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at the phone, oh, that's Tyler calling, forget that. No. I'm picking up. Why? Because I love my brethren. Who's going to win out of my life? Am I doing the will of my Father? Do I love my brethren, number one? Number two, look at chapter 2 and verse 29. Capitulo dos verso 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. Do I practice righteousness? We hear a lot today about being made righteous, and that's a good conversation to have. We need to be made righteous. But there's one concept that, that we can't forget in this idea of being made righteous, and that is the responsibility after being made righteous to live righteously, to practice righteousness. Is that a hallmark of my life? This is part of doing the will of our Father. Am I practicing righteousness? Look at chapter 2 and verse 6. Verso 6. The one who says he abides in him, in Jesus, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Am I following in the footsteps of Jesus? Brother Bestman brought up the way that we dress this morning. Am I dressing in a way that is consistent with the person of Jesus? The way that I talk, is it consistent with Jesus? The things that I value in this life, is it consistent with the person of Jesus? And then look at chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Here's the summary statement, but the summary statement comes at the beginning for John. My little children, I am writing these things to you, so what? So that you may not sin. Now just about everything else he's going to say from chapter 2 and verse 1 through the end of chapter 5 is him addressing these different sins. He's pointing out what sin is. 
before he does all of that, he gets to this big point right here. God's will for my life is what? That I don't sin. Now take that and come back to chapter 2 and verse 17. The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does what? The will of God abides forever. What's God's will for your life? What's God's will for my life? That we would avoid sin. That we would come to Jesus. That we would follow him. That we would live for him. That our steps would be his steps, that our heart would be his heart. If you look at your life this evening and you haven't been following Jesus, what a wonderful opportunity you have this evening to come and to follow him. Maybe as a Christian, you've fallen, you haven't been living as you should, and you need to come back and make sure you're following the steps of Jesus. We want to encourage you to do that, to pray with you and to pray for you. Maybe you've never come to Jesus. Maybe you've never started that journey. If you believe in Jesus and are willing to turn from a life of sin, would you confess him as your Savior, be united with him in baptism, and raised to walk a new life? If you're ready to do that, we want to help you do that this evening. If we can help you respond to the gospel at all tonight, would you let us know by coming while we stand and while we sing?